Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honor to be introducing Lord Williams, Bishop Rowan Williams, and Dr. John Teasdale this evening. I've known both for a long time in various contexts, Rowan for 40 years and John for over 50. Rowan Williams has held many distinguished positions in both church and academia, as you all know. Professor of Divinity at Oxford, Archbishop of Wales, Archbishop of Canterbury, Master of Magdalen College, Cambridge, and much else. He's one of the world's leading theologians and public intellectuals with a grasp of an astonishing range of subjects. And despite all that, he remains a kind, humble, and delightful human being and manifestly a person of prayer in a way that's not always found among bishops. John Teasdale has held positions in the universities of London and Oxford, and most recently held a special scientific appointment in the Medical Research Council's Brain and Cognition Unit in Cambridge. He was a key pioneer in the development of cognitive behavior therapy, and particularly mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. He's a practitioner and teacher of mindfulness, and also a leading figure in the scientific study of mindfulness. And last year he published a path-breaking book on what happens in mindfulness, inner awakening, and embodied cognition. This evening's subject is attending to attention. And as this topic breaks relatively new ground in the conversation between science and religion, I'm going to make four very quick points about why attention is an important subject for a Boyle lecture. Science is based on a distinctive way of attending to the world. Robert Boyle, the founder of these lectures in whose honor we meet today, was a pioneer of this new way of attending to nature, and it underpinned the scientific revolution of the 17th century. And secondly, in the 20th century, psychologists, philosophers, religious writers have all become fascinated by attention. And there's much work to be done bringing their different approaches into conversation with each other. And we'll begin that work this evening. Taking into new territory Robert Boyle's wish to bring a fruitful exchange between science and religion. And third, self-understanding. Understanding ourselves involves noticing how we attend to things. How we personally attend to things shapes the world as we know it and shapes us. And understanding our habits of attention is crucial to understanding ourselves. And last, most spiritual practices, and especially mindfulness, teach us new ways of managing our attention with far-reaching consequences. And I believe that many of the benefits of spiritual practices are mediated through how they shape our attention. A few years ago, we used to hand out hard copies of the lecture as people left the church. These days we will email round a copy of the, of the text of the lecture and the response um, um, f fairly soon, I hope, uh, to all of those who received an email invitation. So I hope that will be reaching you soon. And in a few weeks' time, on the 23rd of March, and you'll receive an email about this, there will be um, we'll be showing the premiere of the recording of this lecture and response and then having a live discussion on Zoom in which you can ask questions if you want to. So we'll send you information about that. But that's enough from me. Attending to attention is a fascinating subject and it's my great pleasure to invite Lord Williams to give this evening's Boyle lecture and then to invite Dr. John Teasdale to respond. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed, George, for your welcome to this wonderful church, and thank you, Fraser, for setting the scene so effectively. To begin with, may I simply say how grateful I am for the honor of being invited to give this lecture this year. It's an area which is well outside my comfort zone, as will shortly be very apparent, but I've taken it as my job this evening certainly to begin a conversation rather than to attempt to end one or even define one. Now, discussions of attention very often cite William James's definition of it, which is that attention is the mind seizing on one of several simultaneously possible objects or trains of thought. The mind seizing on one of several simultaneously possible objects or trains of thought. In a different idiom, but making a not dissimilar point, more recent treatments, like that of Grace Lindsay a couple of years ago, speak of it in terms of the flexible deployment of limited computational resources. The underlying model remains much the same. There is a landscape of stimuli out of which attention selects a specific set of data for further processing or connecting. It's a useful model, but it gets us only so far. And what I want to do in this reflection is both to note where it needs amplifying and reworking, and to draw out some of the implications of such reworking for a wider approach to our understanding of knowledge itself. Central to this interrogation of the widespread model I've mentioned is the work of the French philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty, especially his very substantial book on the phenomenology of perception. But Ian McGilchrist's monumental recent work, about three times as long as Merleau-Ponty's book, the matter with things also has provided me with some significant prompts for rethinking the more simplistic versions of the conventional approach. And in the light of this, we'll also be revisiting the way in which the word attention is used by some philosophers as a morally and spiritually charged phenomenon, in the hope of seeing whether there's any kind of bridge between the psychological and neuroscientific investigation of attention and this more humanistic discourse. So early on in the phenomenology of perception, Melo Ponti devotes a chapter <clears throat> to attention and judgment, in which he explains at some length the paradoxical character of traditional appeals to the simplicity of sense experience. And he argues there that both mechanistic materialism and idealism involve a series of strategies whose effect is actually to avoid the real operation of sense experience. In other words, there's a great deal of philosophy about our experience which is out to stop you experiencing it. What the senses in fact deliver is indeterminate, inconsistent, and radically incomplete. And sustained reflection, including scientific examination, has to begin with the awareness not of a set of discrete and ready-made external data, but of a modified consciousness, as Melo Ponti puts it, a transformation of the mental field, a transformation of the mental field. What the senses actually deliver to us is a field of inchoate perception with which we actively negotiate, which we interpret, connect, and organize before we begin reasoning about it. Melo-Ponty uses as an instance here the processes by which an infant learns to discriminate colors after about nine months. It's not that the infant's mind is receiving a set of color-coded stimuli and failing to sort them out accurately. What's going on is that the infant consciousness 
is being introduced into a field in which it progressively adjusts to a stream of information, developing more or less consistent protocols for sorting it out. After a certain point, it's able to formulate a kind of narrative in which what are now seen as different colors can be understood as potentially present in the earlier indeterminate phase. Or to put it a bit more directly, it's not that the infant is seeing green, but seeing it inadequately. The infant is mapping a territory of perception in which green finally emerges as a durable and usable component of that map. Although Merleau-Ponty doesn't explicitly make the point, that of course is consistent with the fact that different cultures notoriously divide up the palette of colors in different ways, especially at the darker end of the spectrum where purple, blue, gray, and green are clustered very differently in different cultural taxonomic vocabularies. Just a little note here, um, one of the things I, I was involved in a couple of years ago was translating some early Welsh poetry into English, like you do. <clears throat> but notoriously there, the words for gray, green, and blue are wholly indistinguishable. You get the general feeling of the territory in which the words are working, but there are no ready-made boundaries there. As I say, you develop protocols of cutting it up. But the point is that, in this context, attention is not so much a focusing of internal resources on pre-existing external objects, so as to pick them out correctly against their background. Attention is the process of constituting such objects by creating particular boundaries or outlines within the previously indeterminate field. Elements in the field combine to activate elements in the modified consciousness. And what emerges is the object, which we then, so to speak, file for further reference. And subsequently, that cooperatively generated object is presupposed in acts of judgment, when certain features of a perceived environment give sufficient leads for us to suppose the presence of the object. Here's Merleau-Ponty. The men I see from a window are hidden by their hats and coats, and their image cannot be imprinted on my retina. I therefore do not see them. I judge them to be there. And this judgment is not an explanation to make sense of or even to correct confusing bits of perception. It's an act of interpretation that produces the very possibility of a coherent object. And it is in that regard what philosophers would call a transcendental action, an action that relates to establishing the possibility of consistent experience. Merleau-Ponty speaks of a perceptual syntax which gives structure to the various relationships with our environment in which we stand. And the key word here is, of course, relationships. To speak of an object that is constructed by judgment or imagination or a sort of synthetic instinct is not at all to say that the objects are born from the ego or the mind as pure self-reflection. They're held together as what could be called a continuous strategy of responding to certain clusters of stimuli. Both an empiricist and an intellectualist or idealist scheme operate with an unexamined notion of sensation and a timeless model of the normative object. Empirical philosophies presuppose that this normative object is simply there as a source of orderly and connected stimulus. Sense experience is just registering stuff that is coming directly at you. Intellectualism or idealism presupposes that this orderly and connected unit is generated by the individual consciousness inside as a determination of its own imminent capacities. We are looking within and sort of working out what we can see there. But what Merleau-Ponty is sketching is an account of objects of attention 
that takes seriously the location of consciousness in space and time. The involvement of consciousness in the body's immediate negotiating with what surrounds it and the processes by which consciousness gradually constructs these strategies of judgment. So, writes Menoponti, consciousness must be faced with its own unreflective life in things and awakened to its own history, which it was forgetting. Such is the true part that philosophical reflection has to play, and thus do we arrive at a true theory of attention. And this true theory of attention is one that reckons with the active and formative role of attention and the need to see it in relation to time and learning. His phrasing there in that little passage is something I'll come back to later. So to understand attentive perception as the constructing of a field to be explored is to refuse on the one hand a simple cause and effect picture of what happens in the conscious registering of the world around, sense experience just landing and imprinting, and on the other, the idea of a sequence of finished conceptual crystallizings of my own reflexive awareness. So the argument is one that aims to dissolve a set of unhelpfully exclusive binaries. The Cartesian opposition of extension and thought, the separation of sign and meaning, the opposition between cause and reason, and so on. And so William James's formulation with which I started about simultaneously possible objects needs a bit of nuancing so that we can do justice to the recognition that these possible objects are not just lying around ready-made. And this recognition is very importantly inflected in turn by the ways in which we now know that different brain areas construct different kinds of object or, as we might put it, different qualities of objecthood. And so, in Ian McGilchrist's The Matter With Things, we are introduced to the diversity between what is projected by left brain and right brain. Right hemisphere damage, which affects the left visual field, for example, results in a perceptual world in which there are fewer or even no tools for what I've called negotiating the full range of possible objects. Modification of consciousness is partial, and so what is seen is partial. But what's most striking is that this partial consciousness, limited or damaged in some way, has no means of understanding that it is partial. It doesn't know what it doesn't know. As far as your left hemisphere is concerned, writes McGilchrist, what it no longer attends to is not just unseen, but ceases to exist. The left hemisphere, it seems, is a Barclayan idealist. Further, it appears that radical impairment of right hemisphere activity results frequently in a dysfunction in the understanding of time. This can manifest as a forgetfulness about previous perceptions, or as the breaking down of the continuities of perception into a kind of freeze-frame effect, as the inhibition of previously familiar bodily skills, and so on. It's a condition, in fact, which makes impossible precisely the awakening of consciousness to its own history, of which Merleau-Ponty speaks. Consciousness is awareness that it is proceeding or evolving in time. But the dysfunction also extends to location in space. McGilchrist gives several dramatic instances of what this can mean, including the suppression of the perceiving of depth. The activity of the right hemisphere, in short, is what secures continuity in both time and space and the severe inhibition of the activity of this part of the brain makes it impossible to recognize the temporal, the time-related character of consciousness itself. <clears throat> and that's why I think attention 
does need to be refigured a bit as a more complex process than the plain selection of bits of stimuli. Whatever the exact nature of the stimuli that modify the field of consciousness, they can't helpfully be represented as fixed items of information. We are never in a position, so to speak, to photograph a set of stimuli and map that onto how the brain is receiving them. That's not how it works. And we have to take very seriously the roots of the very, very word information. Consciousness is given form by what it encounters, but simultaneously gives form to this. What's going on is a reciprocal activity in which outer and inner flows of energy, for lack of a better phrase, combine to produce a settled habit of perceiving, a protocol, as I called it earlier, for dividing up the field in which consciousness finds itself, and a coherent, narratable relationship. In this reciprocal activity, the granular perception of significant detail in a field is consistently framed by the temporal sense which allows objects to be seen continuously, so that any particular moment, like Merleau-Ponty looking out of the window on the figures in hats and coats in the street, any particular moment like that can be pre-reflectively grasped as belonging in a series that can be assumed to be a continuous succession of perceptions altered by different stances, locations, or perspectives on the part of the perceiving subjects. So that, to bring it down to the present moment, I do have some reason for supposing that what I'm seeing from this pulpit is human beings whose heads are not disproportionately larger than the rest of their bodies and who have backs, or people further back, legs. There is a story that I'm telling myself about what is seeable. What's philosophically interesting here is that a concept of attention informed by these considerations is not just a specific deployment of computational resources, to use that language for a moment, though it is at least that for certain purposes. It's also something shaped by the need or pressure or desire to chart a path through time and space in which a subject or agent can intelligently, safely move. Sometimes sum this up by saying that the first thing we need to know in any theory of knowledge is how not to bump into things. And because of this, no supposedly granular item in the perceptual field can be seen or analyzed in isolation or regarded as a wholly fixed reality. If I create an intelligible object, it's as part of a wider strategy. In William James's terms, it's bound up in a train of thought. And as the global context of such a train of thought or comprehensive strategy shifts, so do the boundaries of the object. Now, in one obvious sense, this is a quite elementary observation on the history of science, and I apologize for making such an elementary observation. The ongoing refinement of investigative techniques changes the way we divide up perceptual fields. But the phenomenology of attention so far outlined presses this a little bit further. It's not only the technical close focus changes that shift definitions of finite substances, but the new constraints of the kind of worldview that may be emerging with the acknowledged needs and questions that come with this. Thomas Kuhn's classic work on paradigm shifts many decades ago observed this, but as some critics noted at the time, his initial use of the term paradigm was loose and the question of the nature of attention itself was not directly addressed by him. Changing worldviews change the questions that are asked. But recognizing this, if it's not to be a doorway into simple relativism or constructivism, should alert us to the question of what it is that shifts the questions in a way that goes a bit deeper than just noticing 
previously unresolved problems. And Kuhn's thesis about the incommensurability of comprehensive scientific theories does less than justice to what an approach like Merleau-Ponty's assumes, which is that it is possible to suppose a shared world of information flow in which diverse maps and taxonomies are not incommensurable in the crude sense of being mutually exclusive, but continue as readings of what that world allows, which to some degree remain what logicians call compossible. You can think of them together. What consciousness learns about itself in the processes of scientific study is that exposure to its own history that is needed in order to liberate us from the illusion that the normative model for attentive knowing is the simple turning of a specific beam of illumination on a set of fixed data. We are, it seems, primed for the construction of diverse narratives of the consistency of what we encounter. Narratives whose diversity is conditioned by the diversity of relations in which at different times and places we stand to that encountered flow of information. Attention will crystallize different clusters of informational content into a strategy or protocol, depending not so much on the problems we want to solve as the connections we wish in this specific kind of relationship to clarify or articulate. What is more, thinking of attention as part of a reciprocal process sharpens our awareness that our own perception shifts the parameters of what is possible for the object. If the subject is finding their way through a complex environment, adjusting and negotiating, then in some sense the object is also adjusting to an environment in which my interaction with it is shifting the boundaries of its reality modifying its field of possibility, the field of what relations are available for it. I am, so to speak, now an item on the object's agenda. This is the point at which some exponents of classical scientific method show signs of panic at what may be represented as panpsychic mythologizing. But it seems to be an unavoidable implication of both the general model presented here of attention as the formation of a strategy of relating and of the ontology, the, the approach to being itself, associated with the discourse, for example, around quantum mechanics. Carlo Rovelli's introduction to this perspective in his very lucid little book, Reality is Not What It Seems, there's the title for a book, <laughs> Rovelli summarizes this very lucidly. What if the electron could be something that manifests itself only when it interacts, when it collides with something else, and that between one interaction and another, it had no precise position. And when an object, atom, electromagnetic field, molecule, pendulum, stone, star, and so on, interacts with something else, the values computed are those which its variables can assume in the interaction. If the flow of information to an embodied consciousness is indeed the creation of a relation rather than the mere registering of data on a passive recording device, we can reasonably speak about our knowledge of objects as a stage in the global adjustment of fields of exchange. The activities of an object are from one point of view just as much habitual strategies as are the conceptual tools with which we find our way around and with them. I happily refer here to Rupert Sheldrake's discussion in his ambitious and not uncontroversial 2012 essay on the science delusion. In this context, we might also return to Ian McGilchrist's treatment of lateralized brain functions to note that left hemisphere activity is in effect only an occasional and limited vehicle for relation since it's not able fully to process the passage of time the process of adjustment, as well as the experience of consistency in which relatedness is actualized. McGilchrist writes of, I quote, the loss of the whole at the expense of the parts, 
in the body's defective self-representation in a condition of right hemisphere damage or inhibition. And contrasts the left hemisphere as that which sees the body as an object out there in space, as opposed to the right hemisphere's sense of the body as a whole, as an inhabited point of orientation. He goes on to note the dominance of right hemisphere activity in small children, as if the primary need for a developing consciousness was to secure habits of connection in the perceiving of objects before refining its capacity for detailed cataloging of an environment. In McGilchrist's terms, consciousness goes for depth before precision. Precision is in fact possible only when depth has been settled. That is when there's a recognition of how objects are fitted into a multi-dimensional perspective and are apprehended continuously, though flexibly, over the passage of time. The very idea of an object or a substance requires the coherent framing, which is the right hemisphere's activity. But at the same time, such framing is not simply the more accurate mapping of an external territory which the consciousness looks out upon. It could be described as a set of instructions both for how to organize incoming information and for how to find an intelligent and consistent way around what resists my own body in its movement in the world. How not to bump into things. It creates not the map of a detached landscape, but a path through which what I already, in, sorry, a path through what I already inhabit and engage with. It populates this space in which I am engaged with objects or substances whose precise activity upon me is given form by the specific questions I pose or problems I seek to resolve. And I need to keep alert to how, when questions change, I may expect new kinds of resistance, new capacities or possibilities to come into focus, new things to bump into. And in thinking about this, it's helpful to bear in mind that an artificial computational system will be able to negotiate an environment only to the extent that it has been provided with responses to a determinate set of informational input. Some of you, I hope, will have read Kazuo Ishiguro's remarkable 2021 novel, Clara and the Sun. And you may perhaps recall in that a very vivid description of the sensory confusion of the eponymous Clara, an advanced AI device, when confronted with a physical environment beyond its programmed limits. A total sensory overload, as we might say, and a total directional confusion. So, to sum up so far, the attention we give to the world around us is indeed a necessary narrowing of our conceptual and computational resources in order to negotiate our way with certain kinds of resistance and difficulty, and to realize certain kinds of possible relationship. But it's important not to reduce this to a simple picture of discrete subjects out there, which we are just trying to see more accurately. Even more important, arguably, to avoid the seductive idea that there is one set of clear data which will prove to be fundamental in understanding what is in front of us so that we can safely ignore, or at least downgrade, other kinds of descriptive response, because these will provide inferior levels of explanation. Attention must attend to the inescapable multi-layered diversity of object construction that's going on, even if it can only develop one particular line of engagement at a time. The unhelpful standoffs between reductionism and holism, the arguments about the relative status of, say, chemical and biological or mathematical and ergonomic explanation are radically misplaced. And I acknowledge a debt here to some unpublished work by Professor Connor Cunningham of Nottingham on the difficulties with the idea of basic explanations. The issue is not about which explanatory discourse is the one on which all others depend, since, 
Just as in Aristotle's vocabulary about different sorts of causality, material, efficient, formal, and final, there can be no viable or sustainable account of how to negotiate a path in relation to the environment that systematically ignores any one coherent set of possibilities for discourse. Furthermore, attention to the diversity of the object construction that is going on is bound up with Merleau-Ponty's insistence on consciousness registering its own temporal and flexible character, its own process of learning how and why diverse questions are worth asking. As revisionist science has so often insisted in the last century or so, it's not that, for example, Newtonian physics is a mistake from which we need to be delivered. The point is that what is coherently thinkable is not exhausted by Newtonian questions. And to suppose that it is would be to set in stone a refusal to attend as comprehensively as we need to. Now then, this begins to steer us towards a very different sort of discourse about attention, which on the face of it seems to have little or nothing to do with what we've been considering so far. So I give you warning of a grinding change of gear. Since the publication of Simone Weil's Essays and Notebooks, of Waiting on God in 1951, two volumes of published notebooks in 1956, her concept of attente, attention, has been repeatedly revisited and elaborated. And it's one of the focal themes of Simone Weil's writing. Attente is defined as that quality of awareness of what is other, the other person, the object, the grammatical rules of a language or the procedures of mathematics, that quality of awareness that necessarily suspends the self-preoccupation of the ego so as to allow the independent reality of the other to be fully received into the subject. Simon Weil writes of this in terms of decreation, the necessary sacrifice of the self in the process of learning. And she argues that educational and scientific work so understood is an intrinsically spiritual activity in that it creates a space between subject and object in which the compulsive violence and acquisitiveness towards the other that characterizes the habitual life of the ego is negated. Professor Nigel Tubbs of Winchester, in his wonderful book, The Philosophy, Philosophy of the Teacher, says that the implication of this is that education is not solely about the truths associated with the content of the teaching process, but about the truth, quote, in the relationship that the student has to the content. Education is not about the content, but about the relationship to the content. And in the context of Nigel Tubbs's discussion, this is about the quality of attente that Simon Weil speaks of. And one of the paradoxes of Simone Weil's moral and spiritual analysis of attention is that it requires the consciousness to be aware that its own self-consciousness is one of its most serious problems. She compares it with the, the children's game or riddle of challenging another child not to think of polar bears for the next five minutes. The self's awareness of its own needs or desires can reduce the object to the dimension of what the subject is looking for, and no more. And the self's awareness of its performance in relating to or negotiating with its environment becomes an object in itself which impedes or distorts the capacity of the informing energy of the other to affect the subject. Radical attente in Simone Weil's sense, is both recognizing the ambiguity of self-awareness and the discipline of exposure to structures that have to be received in their otherness for them to be truthfully engaged. Because the learning of a language, to take one of Weil's favorite examples, involves the sheer labor of internalizing rules we have not chosen, it serves her as a paradigm for undertaking labor that doesn't immediately produce gratification. 
we acknowledge the risks in the centripetal force of the ego's customary habits. But we also register, as Merleau-Ponty too would insist, and incidentally he, um, he shared with Simone Weil the experience of being taught by the rather formidable French philosopher Alain, Emile Chartier. Uh, Merleau-Ponty insists, like Simone Weil, the necessity of seeing how we have in fact learned, how consciousness has been modified, what it feels like to know, to learn. Hence, a voluntary engagement with disciplined study becomes a tool for detaching the conscious self from its own initial concerns and priorities. The good student is one who does not measure what is studied by its congruence with their own supposed needs or interests. Nobody ever began studying the French language with the idea that what they really wanted to know was how to conjugate irregular verbs in French. <laughs> Equally, the good student is the one who does not consistently observe themselves studying. Now, the register of this discussion is very different from the philosophical and methodological concerns we started with. But there is a point of contact in the rejection shared by both approaches of a model of conscious attention as just a searchlight of individual mental activity directed at a selected set of discrete phenomena. The attention discussed by Merleau-Ponty and others is receptive to an active other so that the active subject may become more adequately attuned to the object's agency while also acting upon the field of that object's possibilities so as to give it consistent and intelligible presence in the consciousness. The intrusion of a pre-critical set of projections or expectations on the part of the perceiving subject will get in the way of a truthful, sustainable strategy of response to the incoming information. And the outcome of the encounter is the modification of the subject's field of operation and awareness. We have to turn our backs on the idea that there is a fixed self appropriating functionally useful information about a set of fixed phenomena. And consider instead the model of a constant flow backwards and forwards of information leading to adjustment and modification on both sides. For Simone Weil and those who have followed her, the decentering of the ego and its portrait of its needs and agenda is the fundamental principle of any action that can be considered moral or spiritual. The modification of the consciousness in attentive observation and the knowledge that emerges from it is inseparable, whether you acknowledge the connection or not, from the relativizing of the I, the ego, that is necessary if ethical action is to be possible. So for Simone Weil, there is a further dimension what I call the decentering of the ego in the work of disciplined knowledge prepares the finite self for the apprehension of the infinite. This is to go well beyond the categories of the phenomenological analysis of attention that we've been sketching, but it is worth exploring what convergences may be traced. We might begin by asking what the most comprehensive form of the modification of a field of consciousness would entail. In the perspective here outlined, such an optimal level of awareness is certainly not something that could be thought of in terms of a final, definitive mapping of information received in distinct causal and conceptual packages. Certainly not in terms of reduction to a supposedly basic matrix of causal factors. It would be the recognition of a diffused but also connected informational energy in which subject and object were alike involved. The recognition of what David Bohm famously called in his book of 1980, the implicate order. By definition, this could not be the awareness of a determinate object separate from the observer. It would be to recognize a comprehensively dependent and relation-defined position or continuous series of positions in the immeasurable protean pattern of exchange that constitutes the finite universe. It would be 
a knowledge of the method or process of intelligent observation rather than the concept of some comprehensive system, let alone an infinite object. But the further, obviously contestable point that a religious moralist like Simone Weil would make is that this bare but at the same time global awareness of one's own condition as ceaselessly being informed presupposes an imperative always to move the ego out of the center of any discourse or policy, while at the same time presupposing that what arises when this decentering has taken place is the establishing of a space in which diverse life may blossom without the constraints of force or power exercised by another finite reality. Simone Weil famously sets herself against force as the determining character in our relation with one another or with the universe. In such a condition, there is an implicit recognition of a kind of ideal equilibrium in finite life, which allows each strand in the interactive complex to fulfill its potential as both gratuitous and well-ordered, as beautiful, if you want a shorthand. The very form of finite interaction in its most unconstrained working takes us beyond the level of function or stimulus and response to the idea of a maximal manifestation of congruence, order and harmony in itself for its own sake. And the universal schema of congruent energy in unceasing exchange leaves us with a question about the generating and unifying ground or context which is made manifest in the temporal process of exchange. A question which some will dismiss as unnecessary, even inappropriate, but which has kept recurring with some regularity in cosmology through the ages. Why do things join up? Allowing such a question to arise in and through the receptive understanding of the place occupied by consciousness in the flow of exchange that is the universe is tantamount to a comprehensive attending to what is not in any sense a particular, a thing of any kind. It begins with attention to the more and more complex strands of interaction in which we know ourselves to be involved and culminates in an unavoidably paradoxical attention to the generative and cohesive but unimaginable agency out of which finite patterns of interaction flow. Or in the language of traditional theology, it moves from the contemplation of the universe's order to the awareness of this order as reflective of a living force, what scripture and tradition recognize as divine wisdom. And inescapably, it points to action that cannot be imaged or conceived to what is unlimited, unborn, unavailable to language. Attention culminates in the contemplation of what cannot be understood, but which is the source of a life in which the subject may become more and more freely involved, precisely as it resigns its claim to separateness or self-authorship. And that is simply to rehearse in a slightly more contemporary and much more abstract idiom what the early Christian teachers had to say about the interrelation of the different kinds of theoria, contemplation, in the growth of human awareness of the world and the divine. Theoria may be translated as contemplation, but its simplest meaning is just attentive looking. In the scheme classically articulated around 400 of the Christian era by Evagrius of Pontus, practice theoria opens out onto physice theoria, which in turn leads to theologia, the absorption of the finite subject in the intelligent life, the logos of God. Contemplation, in the sense usually given to that word. Now, practice theoria represents the training of the self in behaviors that are free from passion, that is, from passivity in the face of instinct, compulsive desire, self-oriented emotion, and so on, which impedes the liberty of the intelligent subject. Freedom from passion liberates the subject to see more fully the rational beauty of the created order, 
not as it exists in relation to the subject, but as it reflects the mind or wisdom of God. And that attention to the unifying structure of the phenomenal universe opens in turn onto an imageless receptivity to the creator, which is the summit of all intelligent activity. And that realizing the summit of all intelligent activity, that's the realization of what is distinctively human. It is imageless because the divine is not an instance of any kind of being, not a causal agent among others within the universe, not capable therefore of being summed up in conceptual, let alone imaginative form. Theologia, theology, the contemplation of God, is a form of attention that is both the most natural of human activities and the most eccentric. Natural because it's the culmination of more localized habits of attention, eccentric in that it has no determinate or boundary object, but is a state of simple receptivity to what cannot, unlike the self's other objects, be negotiated with or crystallized into conceivable form since it is the principle or source of form as such, sheer active intelligence. And for the early Christian writers who use this as a canonical structure, it's also crucial that the ultimate contemplative receptivity envisaged is configured as agape, as love, since this is identical with an attention wholly directed away from the ego. This is the space in which the divine is most fully encountered, since the divine life, the divine intelligence, has no boundaried ego to defend, and so is met and engaged with as what could be thought of only as unqualified gift, direction towards the other. As for Simon Weil, in the scheme, attention and love converge, though it is love in a sense very different from mere emotional disposition. Well, attending to attention proves to be a many dimension task. We began from the methodological and philosophical point that the data of the senses can't be taken as fixed quanta of information delivered to a passive observer. Thinking of them like that prevents us looking clearly at what is actually before our senses and leads us to ignore the inescapable role of what I've been calling negotiation between inner and outer, the gradual construction of habits of seeing in which consistent objects are formed as simultaneously the consciousness is modified, informed by what impinges upon it. When we attend to something, an object, a series of phenomena, an argument, an artifact, we are drawing out of it a possible structure which will contribute to one particular instance of world building. A truthful or adequate structure will be one that proves its coherence and durability over time, and attention also requires us to be aware precisely of the time taking, so as to protect us from a mythology of timeless and unrelated objects sitting out there waiting to be known. We need to be aware also of the imbalances in conscious apprehension associated with lateralized functions in the brain as a reminder that the idea of an object or substance is impossible without the, in very broad terms, transcendental dimension of a temporal, dimensionally spatial environment being presupposed. Attention of this kind thus entails a generalized awareness of the presence of what we do not perceive specifically as objects and of the possible diversity of paths of realization for potential objects. And this carries with it a critical recognition of the limits of the individual ego's capacity to produce any single comprehensive or definitive structure. The most damaging mistake we could make in thinking through the phenomenological approach to attention would be to imagine that the subject's constructive or world-building role was just a matter of imposing a pattern devised by the power of the mind, rather than the product of discerning what coherent structure of aspects in the object might find place in one strand of a generally adequate strategy of sustainable relationship with the world around. <laughs>
And that, I suggested, offers a bridge into the discourse around attention associated with writers like Simone Weil, writers for whom the suspension of the claims of the individual ego is fundamental, not only for truthful knowledge, but for moral action. The subject in attention suspends the potential violence of manipulating the object into one final determined pattern, recognizing that it is dealing with forms of active energy that share a process of constant mutual adjustment with the action of the knowing subject. This subject is thus neither passive nor omnipotent, neither determined nor context-free and arbitrarily powerful, neither stone nor God, you might say. But in addition to its negotiating with particular flows of information in its routine operations, the subject is also capable of attention to what makes information and energy possible, but is beyond strict conceptualization. Its detachment from its ingrained self-preoccupation through both the ethical life and the disciplined life of intellect, both of these entailing an attention that is receptive and flexible, may prepare it for this radical openness to a sort of undifferentiated communication, the sheer bestowal of generative gift or love, the act of God. And this, in turn, reinforces the habits of ordinary ethical and intellectual attention. It follows, to note this briefly, that some of the physical habits which enable deeper attention in relation to both finite and infinite otherness are related. The practices that are associated with meditation, silence, attention to the breath and heartbeat, a drawing inwards towards a physical point of focus so as to minimize unnecessary movement and so on, will assist in receptivity towards finite phenomena. As Merleau-Ponty's analysis suggests, adequate or truthful knowledge emerges from an early phase in which there's an openness to the indeterminacy of what is perceived, such that we are subliminally aware of potentials other than those we are about to realize in granular conceptualities. And the experience of such openness in the ordinary history of consciousness, the practice of relaxed but alert physical and sensory focus can help us to demystify and support the more unrestricted receptivity demanded in meditative, or in the stricter sense, contemplative states. Which is why I'm eager to hear what we have to learn from mindfulness in this connection. As Simone Weil argues, the ethical and intellectual can be construed as indirect love for the unconditioned, for God, to the extent that it works by, quote, waiting upon truth, setting our hearts upon it, yet not allowing ourselves to go out in search of it. Simone's, well, Simone Weil's phrasing here is not without its problems. When she says that seeking leads us astray so that we must always wait upon a new scientific truth to deliver itself to us, because our attempts to master it will be distorting, she comes close, uncomfortably close, to denying the active role of a consciousness that inevitably learns to map its environment by deliberate trial and error. You have to try thinking. And her insistence on the destruction of the ego, as if the specific locatedness of the particular subject had no contributory significance, remains an area of tension even, I would say, contradiction in her thinking, comparable, I'm afraid, to her extraordinary animosity towards her own Jewish identity and heritage. But the overall structure she outlines, in which all real learning entails the suspension of the unexamined self, is one that permits essential connections to be made between pedagogy, compassion, and the love of God. If I quote here from Nigel Tubbs again, if the giving of one's attention to learning is of the same quality as the giving of one's attention to suffering, and if attention to suffering is one of the clear marks of an awareness of and participation in the divine perspective, what Simone Weil calls the plane of supernatural love, 
there is indeed a thread leading from research to meditation, which opens up a consistent and challenging doctrine of human learning and human knowing, and requires a commitment to understanding the process of knowing as a necessary dimension of any learning worth the name. In the general task of brokering the conversation between scientific discourse and the world of religious reflection and discipline, attending to attention may yet prove a fertile field. I hope that these very preliminary thoughts may contribute to a more systematic and extended treatment. Thank you for listening. It's, it's an honor and a privilege to have this opportunity to respond to this Boyle lecture presented by such a distinguished and respected figure as Lord Williams. In my response, my aim is to illustrate how Lord Williams' analysis resonates powerfully and pleasingly with current thinking in cognitive science. And to begin, I'd like to focus on an intriguing idea proposed by Anil Seth, who's professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience in the University of Sussex. He suggests that we can see perception as a form of controlled hallucination he explains his view like this, and I'll give quite a long quote now. The brain is constantly making predictions about the causes of its sensory signals. Predictions which cascade down through the brain's perceptual hierarchies. If you happen to be looking at a coffee cup, your visual cortex will be formulating predictions about the causes of the sensory signals that originate from that cup. Sensory signals, which stream into the brain from the bottom up or outside in, keep these perceptual predictions tied in useful ways to their causes. By adjusting top-down predictions so as to suppress bottom-up prediction errors, the brain's perceptual best guesses maintain their grip on their causes in the world. The most important ingredient in the controlled hallucination view, he continues, is the claim that perceptual experience, in this case the subjective experience of seeing a coffee cup, is determined by the content of the top-down predictions and not by the bottom-up sensory signals. We never experience sensory signals themselves. We only ever experience interpretations of them. It seems as though the world is revealed directly to our conscious minds through our sensory organs. With this mindset, it's natural to think of perception as a process of bottom-up feature detection, a reading of the world around us. But what we actually perceive is a top-down, inside-out neuronal fantasy that is reined in by reality, not a transparent window onto whatever that reality may be." End of quote. Now, counterintuitive as it may seem at first glance, Seth's view resonates powerfully with Lord William's conclusion that phenomenal experience is not simply the result of the mind passively registering the presence of pre-existing objects. Rather, as he suggested, phenomenal experience is the outcome of a continuing dynamic interaction between, on the one hand, information arriving from the senses, and on the other, the interpretations our minds construct to make sense of that information. Now, the good news from both Seth's and Lord Williams' views 
is that the substantial top-down, inside-out contribution to the way we see the world opens an exciting possibility. This is that we can develop new and more wholesome ways of seeing the world. And as Lord Williams suggests, one of the key vehicles for creating these new worlds of experience is attention. Now, it's a commonplace that we can change the information the mind processes by changing what we attend to. A more radical approach is to develop new worlds of experience by changing how we attend. And this essentially was the thrust of Lord William's discussion of Simone Weil's attente. Equally, a change in how we pay attention figures centrally in John Kabat-Zinn's widely quoted definition of mindfulness as the awareness that emerges through paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. Now, an experimental study by Norman Farb and his colleagues is highly relevant here and can anchor our discussion. These researchers scanned volunteers' brains while they attended to self with either a narrative focus or an experiential focus. In the narrative focus condition, participants thought about the self, whereas in the experiential focus condition, they attended directly to the experience of self. These two different modes of self-focus were associated with quite distinct patterns of underlying brain activity. Further, and very importantly, participants who'd received eight weeks training in mindfulness showed a lasting shift in underlying brain activity in the direction of greater experiential focus. So Farb's results suggested two key conclusions. First, changing how we attend to self can shift us from one mode of self-experience to another, each mode having its own distinct brain signature. Second, by learning how to pay attention mindfully, we can affect long-term changes in the way we experience self, measurable at the brain level. So generalizing from these findings, we might say that by learning how to attend differently, we can learn to shift the underlying configuration or shape of our minds at will. Now that sounds impressive, but why would we want to? Why would we want to shift from the shape of mind associated with narrative self-focus to a shape associated with experiential self-focus. Studies of mind-wandering, the streams of thinking that fill our minds when they're not otherwise engaged, suggest an answer. Investigations that have probed the content of these thought streams reveal the unsurprising finding that they are predominantly focused on thoughts about the self. In the words of Dan Goldman and Richie Davidson, our minds wander mostly to something about ourselves. My thoughts, my emotions, my relationships, who liked my new post on my Facebook page, all the minutiae of our life story. Those reveries knit together our sense of self from the fragmentary memories, hopes, dreams, plans, and so on, that sent on I, me, and mine." End of quote. In other words, mind-wandering is dominated by narrative self-focus. We dwell and are often lost in thinking centered on ourself. And a well-known study of mind-wandering suggests this is a problem. 
In 2010, Harvard psychologists Matthew Killingsworth and Daniel Gilbert published a paper entitled, A Wandering Mind is an Unhappy Mind. Participants had been contacted at random intervals during their everyday lives and asked what was on their minds at that moment and how they were feeling. Their minds were not on what they were doing, their minds had wandered to something else, a striking 47% of the time. And at these times, participants rated themselves significantly less happy than when their minds were on what they were doing. And crucially, this wasn't simply because they were thinking unhappy thoughts. They were also less happy when their minds wandered to neutral topics. It seems as though there's something about mind wandering itself with its narrative self-focus that makes us less happy. Now, these findings suggest a huge potential opportunity to increase the sum total of human happiness. If we can reduce mind wandering, we can feel happier. How then are we to reduce mind wandering? Well, an exhaustive review of the relevant literature highlighted an obvious candidate for the job, and I quote from this review. Practices that encourage, individual, in, that encourage individuals to be mindful of the present are currently the most empirically validated technique for minimizing the disruptive effects of mind wandering. We noted earlier Fav's study suggesting mindfulness training increases experiential self-focus. This points to the possibility of increasing happiness by learning to pay attention in a different way. Switching out of our default narrative self-focus to a more experiential form of self-focus. Now, evidence suggests that narrative and experiential focus have a reciprocal relation with each other, each interfering with the other. And such a reciprocal relationship has been widely recognized in meditative and contemplative paths for many years. We see, we saw it in Lord William's description of attente as that quality of awareness of what is other that necessarily suspends the self-preoccupation of the ego so as to allow the independent reality of the other to be fully received. So the awareness is suspending the self-preoccupation. On the other hand, anyone who's practiced mindfulness will be very aware of the barrage of inner mental chatter that's the most obvious obstacle that hinders their best attempts to cultivate direct experiential awareness. This reciprocal relationship. And equally, the inner silence to which Martin Laird points in the title of his lovely book on Christian contemplation, Into the Silent Land, is one that transcends this chatter and opens us to direct experience at progressively deeper levels of being. In my book, um, What Happens in Mindfulness, Inner Awakening and Embodied Cognition, which um, Fraser very kindly mentioned in his um, very generous introduction, I offer a way to understand the reciprocal relationship between narrative and experiential modes of mind and why narrative self-focus makes us less happy. To do that, I use a particular cognitive science framework, Interacting Cognitive Subsystems, ICS for short. This framework was originally developed by Phil Barnard, and I'm deeply grateful to him for the many rewarding conversations that have substantially informed and shaped the ideas in that book. Here, as I come to the end of my time, I can only offer the briefest of thumbnail sketches of these ideas. 
ICS recognizes two distinct kinds of meaning and knowing. A, a conceptual way of knowing and an holistic, intuitive way of knowing. These ways of knowing have different evolutionary histories and underlying structures. They served different evolutionary functions. They are linked to different core affects, different ways of paying attention, and they create different worlds of experience. ICS suggests that an ongoing conversation between these two ways of knowing underpins what psychologists call the mind's executive resources, resources that support the conscious processing required in novel, complex, or difficult situations. As in many conversations, at any one time, one or the other partner will tend to dominate the course of the interaction. These executive resources are limited, and ICS suggests our two ways of knowing compete for control of those limited resources. The way of knowing that wins that competition controls attention, the shape of the mind, and molds our world of experience in each moment. This competition underpins the reciprocal relationship between narrative and experiential focus we have noted. When conceptual knowing is in control, our moment-to-moment -moment experience is of thinking. By contrast, when holistic intuitive knowing is in control, our moment-to-moment -moment experience is of a spacious, receptive, engaged awareness. Now we have good evidence that conceptual knowing underpins mind-wandering. The pervasiveness of mind-wandering reflects the fact that in our present culture, our default mode of mind is one where a conceptually dominated quest to find happiness by achieving self-related goals wins the competition for the control of the mind's executive resources. Crucially, we can shift the outcome of that competition and achieve greater wholeness and happiness by deliberately cultivating modes of mind with holistic intuitive knowing in control. <coughs> modes of receptive awareness, mindfulness, contemplation. Some years ago, Lord Williams suggested, and I quote, contemplation is the only ultimate answer to the unreal and insane world that our financial systems and our advertising culture and our chaotic and unexamined emotions encourage us to inhabit. In his Boyle lecture, he eloquently reminded us of the crucial role of attention in contemplation. Concluding, he expressed the hope that what he very modestly called his very preliminary thoughts would serve to broker further the conversation between scientific discourse and the world of religious reflection and discipline. I share that hope and deeply appreciate Lord William's contribution tonight to that ongoing, very live conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for the 2023 ISSR Boy Lecture on Science and Religion. For more information about ISSR or the Boyle Lectures, please visit us at our website, which you can find the link to below. If you joined us for the YouTube premiere on 23 March 2023, then please join us now for a live discussion with Professor Fraser Wants, Dr. Harris Wiseman, Reverend Dr. Joanna Calicut, Lord Williams, or Rowan Williams, and Reverend Professor Michael Rice. The link for the live discussion is located in the Digital Boy Lecture invitation email used to access this video. Please switch to that now. However, if you're watching this anytime after that date, then you can watch the discussion here on the ISSR YouTube channel. Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again next year.